Lawn Gone Native Workshop. Your local guide to planning and implementation of a native landscape. Presented by the City of Stevens Point, The Wild Ones, University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, and Portage County Land and Water Conservation. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Mark Cordes. I am the Neighborhood Improvement Coordinator for the city, so that means I enforce the codes of the city related to lawns and those sorts of things. Uh, I am certainly not an expert in the field of native lawns, but we do have experts here. I'm the one that's going to be responsible for enforcing this should we get complaints or reviewing your plan. Um, so we'll get into that in just a little bit, but I, again, want to thank you for coming. and. Um, I did break it. Well, I'll, I'll operate for you. Okay. So we're going to go through introductions. As I said, I'm Mark Cordes. I work for the city of Stevens Point, and we will jump in with Paul. If you just want to give a quick introduction as to who you are, and uh, sure, you know. I'm Paul Skowinski. I work for the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point Extension Lakes Office. So I am. Oh yeah, I should actually talk into the mic. Um, <laughs> The Extension Lakes Office, we work mostly with lakes and some wetlands and streams around the state. Uh, I'm mostly with water quality and, and bio biological aspects of lakes around the state. Um, so I work a lot with nutrient pollution and ways to reduce nutrient pollution and to improve water quality. I'm also the past president of the Wild Ones chapter here in central Wisconsin. And I'm just a hobbyist as far as native plant gardening goes. That's me. All right, uh, Amberly. I'm Amberly Schwartz. I'm the current president of our local chapter of Wild Ones, Wild Ones Central Wisconsin. We focus on landscaping using native plants in order to improve habitat for pollinators and improve water quality for shorelines. You might have seen some of our gardens around town, including the Piffner Park shoreline planting with all the flowers. It's one of our gems. Paul designed that one. Um, and I also have a small business doing native plant landscaping on this side, and so I have some experience and knowledge with this. So I'm here to help. Maria. Uh, Maria Moore, I've met some of you already on our tours. Uh, I work in the Community Development and Inspection Department. I'm the Community Development Technician. It's very broad, and my job is very broad as well. So I get to partake in special projects like this, and happy to be here. And I just want to say about Paul, even though he says he's the hobbyist with, with uh, native plantings, native lawns, he is literally the expert on aquatic plants in the state, state of Wisconsin. When you say he wrote the book, he literally wrote the book on aquatic plants in Wisconsin. You can go on Amazon and check that out. <laughs> uh, so the journey, how did we get here? Uh, prior to April of 2022, the city had no ordinance that would allow a native lawn. So that means you were held to the same standard as everyone else. Would I enforce it that way? No, I try to give as much leniency as possible. In fact, I would ask people voluntarily to give me a plan because almost always there was a conflict between neighbors. And even though my job is code enforcement, I look at more as you know, really keeping the peace between neighbors. So anything I can do to foster that. So prior to April 2022, we had no ordinance in place that would allow a native lawn. And in fact, uh, the wild ones, I, I understand from our conversations with more of the natu national chapter, that's one of their struggles is with municipalities that have uh, old ordinances that essentially just regulate turf grass and don't allow anything above like an eight inch uh, height. So that becomes a problem for people in, in those municipalities where they aren't allowed by, um, by the ordinance. And especially if you have a very zealous code enforcement person that likes their city to look like a, a golf course, so that becomes problematic. So we, we did adopt that. Um, the new uh, ordinance does allow for native lawns, the plan submittal, and that review is just very basic. Uh, we didn't want it to be technical. We wanted it that the average person could submit something and get it easily approved, uh, and, and just that we could follow along that you were actually uh, uh, implementing this plan and what your, your plan was. Um, then we started with the Lawns Gone Native program, which is on our website, which helps you kind of self-plan. We did a tour this uh, last August and at a, kind of two or three different dates uh, throughout um, Stevens Point, showing different sites and, and that we could look at the plants and, and see what was there. Um, 
So tonight's workshop, we're just going to help you kind of develop your own personalized plan and you know, hopefully go from there. There's experts here, there's some mentors that are gonna be available and things like that. I also wanna recognize just the people in this room that kind of came together to make this happen because again, not everybody in the, the city really appreciates this. The people in this room obviously do, but understand for every person that's here that wants a native lawn, I almost always have a neighbor next door that has a golf course. And they call me and they're very upset. So again, it's trying to keep the peace. And, and I have one quick story. There was a, a gentleman and his light wife, they lived there for you know, 50 some years. Lawn was very perfectly manicured. Person next door had a pollinator lawn that she had planted and, and done a very nice job with. And they wanted to know, um, and, and she had submitted a plan to me, so I brought the plan out and we were looking at the plan and they kind of understood, they didn't like it. But then they asked the question what they could do about any vegetation across the property line. This is no exaggeration. I said, well, you know, once across the property line, you own it. So she said, you mean I can cut it? She said, I said, yes. She went in the house and got a paper scissors and started along that entire chain link fence, a hundred some foot long lot with a paper scissors trimming every single piece of vegetation that was growing through that chain link fence. So that's the level of um, uh, scrutiny that we have going on out there. So for every side, there's an opposite side to what's happening. We really tried to address that with, within this ordinance. All we need is a plan view, essentially an overhead view of what you plan on doing, you know, where your plants are going to go, uh, succession areas, and if it's going to be over multiple years, which years those, those areas are going to be planted. Uh, a narrative description, again, Paul will get into more of this uh, and the other presenters, but a narrative description, just the type of plantings, uh, transitional areas, timelines, including main management and maintenance techniques. So a lot of people, there's, there's passive and active uh, restorations, and passive restoration is kind of letting things more go naturally. That takes um, a little bit of, of effort on your, your part, uh, where an active restoration is something that you're actively you know, tilling soil and, and you know, transplanting everything that's on the, uh, on the site or within that area. So just identifying those things. So we know, again, when we get a complaint, and I, I've just had one last month, and it made it all the way to the mayor's office, and the mayor was out there, um, that they didn't like the transition planning in this plan, but, and, and so just understand, I have to try to represent both things, keep the peace here, and it sometimes does get political. As much as I don't want to say it does, it does get political. So again, it goes back to not everybody <laughs> appreciates the native lawns, uh, landscape uh, that, that you would maybe appreciate or want planted at your house. Uh, and I do need to respond to those complaints. So. The ordinance hopefully addresses those things. This is directly out of our ordinance. Uh, again, very simple, very basic. Paul and Amber Lee both had input on this. A native lawn is just meaning you have submitted a vegetation management plan, it's been approved, and you may exceed the eight inch uh, height of, of uh, vegetation in your lawn. The um, vegetation management plan, you can read this, but ultimately it just it, it, it's basic. We wanted the layperson to be able to design and implement this. And I'm not an expert, so I need to be able to look at it. I need to be able to say, yes, they're complying. So really, th those are the uh, ordinance standards. Those are directly from the definition uh, within our ordinance in Chapter 21. They're cut and pasted in there. And then, so it gets into lawn maintenance. So there is a little bit of an overlap here. You know, if you don't comply, then we can actually we can actually have a contractor go on your property. The state statute gives us the ability to have somebody go in there and correct the problem. It's called abatement. And uh, we try not to do that. We will give you notice to come into compliance, but that's worst case scenario. I've never had that happen with anybody that's had a native lawn, never. So I don't anticipate it's gonna happen now. Um, the one thing we have added, if you do submit a vegetation management plan, it has been approved. So in the state of Wisconsin, case law has determined once vegetation crosses a property line, it becomes the property of that other owner. So a branch grows across the property line, right where that branch crosses the property line, that other owner can, can legally cut it. If you have submitted and received approval on a vegetated, vegetation management plan, we are asking you as part of that plan to maintain that property line. Again, for me, that's just trying to be a good neighbor. So if you're going to be having a, a, a native uh, a lawnscape and your neighbor has the golf course, you will need to maintain that property line. So that is one thing we are asking you abo above and beyond to what we would typically ask anyone else. And that's really about all you need to be aware of. Again, if there's any questions specific to what we're going through you don't understand, just ask 
me or any of the presenters. If there are general questions, just hold them till the end. Um, we have uh, an FAQ site on our uh, FAQ page on our website, and that's the link. Uh, we're waiting on, we submitted for a grant, which should help to offset costs on planting. We're waiting to hear back from that. Hopefully we hear back from that in the next um, couple of months. Signs. We are going to have two types of signs. One's going to be in progress sign because when the planting occurs, sometimes it doesn't look the greatest for the first year or two when the plants are taking hold. So we're going to get a kind of a you know construction in progress sign that also to bring attention to the program, but bring attention to the fact that you're actually doing a planting on this property. So those are going to be more like the campaign style signs. And then we're also looking at once the lawn is established after a year or two, um, either it would be, if we can get somebody to sponsor it, a nice custom made wooden sign that the lawn gone native and, and these would be presented to people. There may be another option in which if you're willing to offset part of the cost, we would make those signs personalized because they are going to be individually made. So you'd be able to have your name on it or your address, something like that. A, a survey will be going out to everyone, a survey monkey to just inquires to interest what type of signs people would be interested in if you're willing to pay a little bit in order to get a custom, you know, personalized sign because that's something we may have the ability to do. Those are things coming in the very near future. Lister Mentors is being created to help you with your plan, to help you with your implementation. And again, I talked a little bit about that survey, but the survey will be coming after this. And that is it. I think Paul is next. Oh, I think if you hit it one more time. Okay. Well, I'm glad to be here. This is a fun topic for me to talk about, so you'll hear some maybe some excitement in my voice as we go through the presentation here. Uh, I already introduced myself. I'm, I'm part of the Extension Lakes team at UWSP, uh, also past president of our chapter of Wild Ones here. So you're going to see a little bit of my personal garden uh, in this slideshow and some other gardens I've helped with, and we're really going to be talking a lot about tips and tricks of what we've learned. Amber Lee will share a few things as we go along as well. Uh, mistakes we've made, uh, advice to go forward for you guys in developing your own native plant gardens. So first of all, we'll talk about preparation and planting, what we can do to get started, how to plan this site, um, tips and tricks for lower maintenance. Nobody wants to maintain all the time. Uh, it's the reason I don't like having a lot of lawn because I don't like mowing it all the time. So I would rather have a lower maintenance uh, native of plant garden in place of that lawn. Uh, we'll talk about some design considerations using plugs versus using seeds, advantages of, the, of both of those. Growing your own native plants if you want to do that, if you want to just get seed either from our Wild Ones uh, meeting in November where we usually have a seed exchange or you can buy seeds and you can grow your own if you want to go that route. We have a few examples around the Stevens Point area that you guys can go check out and some recommended species at the end for dry sites and moist sites. Any questions before we get rolling? All right. So one slide about Wild Ones. If you've, you've heard this term a couple of times now, Wild Ones is a national group that really promotes the use of native plants in landscaping practices. And there's chapters in many states. We have uh, just about every county in Wisconsin represented by a chapter. Our chapter here in central Wisconsin is mostly Portage, Wood, Wapaka, Marathon counties, uh, primarily with our members. And we typically meet at Schmeekley Reserve, so right here in town. Uh, if you're interested in joining, go to wildones.org and then choose the Central Wisconsin chapter and you can join our chapter or talk to Amber Lee and she can fill you in with more details. All right, so when I talk about native plants, I am talking about a species that is native to Wisconsin at the state level and has been growing here since before European colonization. That's kind of a broad definition of a native plant. Some people will get more specific than that and say, in order to be native, it has to be, the genetics have to be from within 25 miles of this location or something like that. Um, in my opinion, state level is pretty good compared to getting plants from Asia or South America or something and bringing those to Wisconsin. Um, if it's native somewhere in Wisconsin, that's, that's pretty good. So some examples would be for a wetter area, the cardinal flower on the left, Lobelia cardinalis. If you're familiar with flower gardening in general, you've probably heard of the Lobelia genus before. Uh, this is one that is a native species to Wisconsin, usually growing along floodplain areas, but in fairly dry soil sometimes. 
Um, the Ohio spiderwort in the middle is a dry, seas, uh, dry site species, generally two to two and a half feet. Blooms really vibrant blue in the morning and then closes up around lunchtime and you don't see it again until the next morning. And then on the right is a Rudbeckia, the common black-eyed Susan and a Coreopsis in the back. Again, you probably have heard Rudbeckia and Coreopsis before. These just happen to be species from those groups that are native to Wisconsin. And one important point is if you're used to flower gardening, You've, you're probably familiar with growing many of these species already. It's just that it's just a slightly different species in the same group. If you've grown a different Rudbeckia, you can grow a Rudbeckia that's native to Wisconsin. It's not like you have to really change your ways of growing plants. You just have to pick different species. So as far as preparation goes, uh, time spent planning now will save you a lot of time and headache later and money later. So take the time to do some planning ahead of time, where you're going to put the garden, what kind of plants you're going to put in, how you're going to maintain it, how big it's going to be, all that kind of stuff. The results will be better and faster if you prepare for it ahead of time. And right now, it's, we're getting into fall, unfortunately. Summer's over. Um, this is a good time to be planning. Next spring is a good time to plant in middle of May. So you've got lots of time now to think about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how you're going to maintain it. You've got uh, too many months now here before springtime comes. And uh, seeds can be stratified over the winter. If you want to grow your own plants, you can stratify them now. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. But you can do it over the winter time, and, and you can grow your own plants or start your garden from seed in the springtime. And I mentioned a little bit before, there is a native plant seed exchange with our Wild Ones chapter in November, generally is part of our November meeting. It's November 9th at the library in the Pinery Room. Perfect. All right. We encourage and you, you to be. We encourage you to be a member. We encourage you to bring seeds that you have as long as you know what species they're coming from. Um, but you don't have to be. We'll let you in anyway. <laughs> yep. There's usually an abundance of seeds that generally we, we probably have 40 to 50 species available and, and people are just looking to get rid of them by the end of the evening. We have so many. So um, feel free to show up and grab some free seed. So as far as uh, planning a garden, uh, as far as what you want out of this garden, think about how many things you can accomplish at the same time. It's not just one thing. You can have an aesthetic, beautiful garden that also serves as a privacy screen and also serves as a, a bird attracting garden and it may also be a rain garden. So it's a stormwater uh, collection feature. All of those things can be done at the same time with one garden. You just have to plan it that way. So this is an example of uh, a garden that somebody planted as a wall from the neighbor. That's the, that was the purpose of this one. It was, it's not only beautiful and extremely colorful and sounded like a freight train with a number of bumblebees in there, <laughs> but uh, it was really designed as a screen from dogs and an unsightly uh, property next door. Um, wildlife value is a huge one. It's a huge reason why people use native plants because they tend to have a lot more value for all kinds of wildlife than non-native species do. So this is a painted lady butterfly, one of our native butterflies to Wisconsin, taking nectar from a purple coneflower. And water quality improvements is something that I like to focus on just because of my professional background. You might wonder why a garden has any impact on, a water, on water quality of a river or lake nearby, but the storm water that just fell as you guys were walking in here today, a lot of that is collecting in the storm drains and it's going right to the Wisconsin River, it's going to McDill Pond and delivering a lot of nutrients and pollutants of all kinds into those water bodies. So if we can capture that water on site and allow it to filter into the ground, then that pollution is captured on site and not going into the local waterways. So it can, it can have a big impact on algae blooms and various kinds of contamination in those water bodies. Um, this is an example on the right of a green lawn contest. We got a couple of landowners here along a lakeshore, clearly fertilized lawns. They have removed every single tiny piece of vegetation from along the shoreline. So there is no way that anything will be intercepted before it reaches the lake. And this is in uh, Manitowoc County where the soils are heavy, clay-based, 
there's very little infiltration during a heavy rain, so it just hits the ground and it runs right down to the lake. So what you've got here now is there's a fringe of bright green right along the lake shore there. That's duckweed, which is a native group of plants, but they're indicators of high nutrient loading. So not surprising to see a whole bunch of duckweed right there because it's, it's telling us there's a lot of nutrients coming off the shore right here. And out further in the lake, there is what you see is remnants of aquatic plants plants that were out there that are now dead because they were smothered by the filamentous algae. And what you see now is these big long strands of filamentous algae left behind. There's not even a, a plant in there anymore. Um, so you can't really boat through there. You can't make a cast in there if you're going fishing. That's what I was there for. and That was a, a big letdown. <laughs> um, but you, you really don't want to swim in there. It's really, it, it really impacts the recreation and aesthetics of the lake. So where should you put a native plant garden? They can go pretty much anywhere. It's just like any other kind of flower gardening. You put the right plant in the right place. It doesn't matter if it's a native plant or a non-native plant. You got to think about what kind of moisture it needs, what kind of sun exposure it needs. So as long as you do that, you can choose the right native plant for the site. Wet areas or low spots are perfect opportunities. A lot of the north side of Stevens Point, especially where the soils are a little bit heavier, a little richer, water tends to pool in certain areas during heavy rains and water and the, the grass doesn't like to grow there. So if you have to keep trying to get the grass to grow every year because it doesn't like growing there or reseeding it, maybe that's a good spot. That's a low hanging fruit right there. Maybe I can turn this little spot into a little native planting instead. Or my favorite type of garden is a rain garden. You can think about putting a rain garden in that spot to capture some storm water. Any difficult area where long grass doesn't want to grow, maybe it's the north side of your house where it's too shady, maybe it's a wet spot, maybe it's under a maple tree, um, some place like that, you could think about putting native plants there. And near uh, a common place to view the garden is a good spot next to a window next to your patio where you can appreciate that that beauty of that garden often um, native plant gardens have a ton of life in them and you won't fully appreciate it unless you get within 10 feet of it get right up in there and see all the different critters that are in there all the bumblebees all the butterflies all the birds that are in there um, near downspouts they can help with infiltration right there at the bottom of the downspout you can also use underground piping to run to a rain garden. You could connect it directly to a, a, a downspout. You don't even have to move it when you mow the lawn. You can just run it right underneath the lawn and run it right to the rain garden. We did that at our, at our old house. Uh, actually, this is, this is our old house. This is one of our rain gardens that we put in at the old house. Um, we had a basement moisture issue. We had one wall that was always wet after a heavy rain. It'd be wet for a few days. It'd be dripping a little bit down on the floor. And we had a basement contractor come in. He said, sure, for $9,900, yeah. we can fix the problem. We're going to jackhammer a trench along the perimeter of your basement, put in two sump pumps, and the water's going to flow through there to the sump pumps, and it'll get a pumped out. And I said, that's not fixing anything. That's just allowing water to come in my house and getting rid of it. So how can we actually fix the problem? It was clearly because of the rain. The rain would always trigger this within a day. So we decided, well, plan A is going to be, we're going to try to attack this from the, the source. We're going to try to take that water away from the house and put it into rain gardens first. If that doesn't work, we'll think about plan B, which is the basement contractor idea. But we made three rain gardens. We spent about seven or eight hundred dollars on plants. Um, we bought those paver blocks. So all in all, it probably cost us about a thousand dollars to put three rain gardens in. We then put rain barrels at the corners of the houses, and we put underground piping, overflow pipes from the rain barrels, underground to the rain gardens. So we got all the water between 15 and 35 feet away, depending on the rain garden that, we, that it was going to. Within a month, we never saw water in our basement again. And it was $1,000 compared to the, the 10,000. And we would have had water in our basement all the time. And I don't think it would have been a good selling point for a buyer either to see that water was just coming into the house all the time. It would have been musty and, and humid downstairs all the time. 
Um, so something to think about, it's an option for if you do have a moisture issue in the basement, you can try to capture that water instead of letting it pool near your foundation, deliver it somewhere else, put it into a rain garden. Um, some municipalities, including Stevens Point, do offer tax credits for rain barrels and rain gardens. And it is currently a refund of the stormwater fee on your utility bill for the year. It's a one-time credit. So there is a tax incentive there as well. It's not huge, but there's something there for you. All right, so this is a, a video of my current rain garden, uh, which was actually doing this right when I left today to come here. <laughs> Uh, this is not from this year. This is from when the rain garden was one year old, but you'll get to see what it looks like when that water is, is coming out. So this was during a one and a quarter inch rainstorm over the course of about 15 minutes. So it was coming down pretty hard, really flying out of there. Uh, we have over a thousand square feet of rooftop that goes through that one downspout purposely designed that way so it's all delivered to the rain garden we don't have any storm water that leaves our property it goes into the rain garden or it goes into the backyard and soaks in there and from the road you can't even tell that that's a rain garden it doesn't look like a storm water management feature it looks like a flower garden to most people as they go by okay any questions so far maria Yes, so the question is, uh, is there enough variety of plant species that can accommodate a uh, shady rain garden, right? Is that the question? Okay, so yes, rain gardens are actually extremely versatile in what you can plant in them because they have moist areas at the bottom and they have dry areas near the top. So you have a lot of versatility as far as what you can plant there. Um, shady species, um, there are not as many native plants that like shade that are real good landscaping species. So it's a little bit more difficult. Um, but yes, there are still dozens of species that will work. And you can also use taller plants to shade other plants. If you put them to the south of another species, then you can tend to create shade. And so if you really, if you have a sunny site, but you want a shady species, you could create a sort of semi-shade spot and you could put that plant there. So again, it's all about planning. If you, I'm going to put this plant here and I'm going to put this plant here and they're going to complement each other for some reason. So uh, something that to think about is as far as weed seeds go, you have weed seeds in your soil. Every one of you do. I do too. They're not going anywhere. They will grow and they will be competing with your plants when you put them in. So this is a shot of an area where I seeded it. And what you see in the photo, if you know any of those plants, none of them are desirable species. These are all weeds that came up in the soil. And I remember this was one of the first things, first uh, plantings I ever did. I, I sat out there and I thought, where are all those plants? I spent hundreds of dollars on all this seed. I don't see a single one. I see plantains and I see nightshade and I see crabgrass and I see creeping Charlie and I see all this junk that I don't want. And the fact is, a lot of those things germinate sooner than native plants will, and they grow faster. So they get a big head start on your native plants. Um, and so for, mostly for that reason, from that experience and a couple others, I don't really use seed anymore. If I use seed, it's to grow it ahead of time, and I use them, I put them in as potted plants, because then they have a big head start on the weeds. Um, but I'll show you a couple of ideas to um, to combat the, the weed competition. So one thing to keep in mind, you have some weeds out there that are okay. They're not really that big of a deal. You could go out there and meticulously pick every one of these little Veronicas here, the Speedwells, or since it only gets to be six inches tall anyway, you can have your other plants growing right in the middle of it and it'll basically just be a ground cover that presents, prevents worse weeds from coming in. So 
keep that in mind as an option that maybe just because you didn't plant it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad species you should be pulling out. It's more maintenance to keep pulling these things out, but chances are you're going to pull it out and it's going to turn out to be something even worse is going to come in next and that's going to require even more maintenance. So use these things as, as ground covers sometimes if it works out that way. Um, typically I plant things as potted plants in a one per square foot density. So after one full growing season, they tend to be touching anyway and they shade out the areas between the bases of those plants and they shade out weeds that try to get to, uh, established there. So it's sort of self-maintaining after the first full growing season. Um, at my house right now we have about 2,500 square feet of native landscaping and I probably spend about four hours a year weeding because they really only grow around the perimeter. They don't grow in the interior of the gardens because they're too thick and the weeds can't find a good place to be. So um, I highly recommend it. that. It obviously takes more money to plant at a higher density, but it's a much better result in the long run. It's a lot less time on your part later. So, you go on. yeah, question. Did you say it was one plant per square foot? Yes, one plant per square foot. Uh, there's a few smaller plants like nodding onion. I use that one a lot. I, I do plant that at more of an eight inch spacing because they're small plants and even a one foot density, there's still quite a bit of space between them and then you've got a bunch of weeds growing in between. And nodding onions, when they bloom, if you've got a whole bunch of them in a big grouping, it, if it's just a continuous bloom, it's, it's almost like a pink smoke over the, over the garden. So it's, it's got a really cool appearance when it's tightly grouped. All right, so I mentioned plugs a little bit, or potted plants. This, you will have much faster results. The picture on the, light, on the left is a smooth blue aster that I grew from seed inside the house, uh, ready to be transplanted outside. The one on the right, what you see in the little pot that I'm holding is a seedling of lanceleaf coreopsis, which is a really pretty yellow flowered uh, dry soil species. Those ones were seeded in that pot and they were left outside to just germinate whenever they were ready in the springtime. The plants right next to them, to those little seedlings, are ones from a nursery that I bought at the same time. So you can see how much bigger those plants are. Those, those plants were $2 a piece, but they're six inches tall. They've got 50 leaves on them. They've got huge root systems. They have a huge advantage over any kind of seedlings of weeds that are trying to grow next to them. And if you put those tiny little coreopsis seeds in, some other weed right next door is going to be growing at three times the rate and it's going to compete that, uh, out compete it or shade it out. So plugs are by far the better way to go. Definitely more expensive, but the results are so much better and so much faster. So we talked about that a little bit already. Uh, pros and cons of each. Plugs are more expensive, but they're much faster. The results are much better in terms of the way that you see it, the way that your neighbor sees it, the way that Mark Cordes sees it. <laughs> Everybody is going to just appreciate the results so much better uh, with plugs. They do require more watering, so don't put a plug in the ground before you have 90 degrees in sun for a week and just leave it out there. It's not going to make it. Um, it's got a big plant. It's got a lot of leaves. It's losing a lot of moisture through those leaves, so you do have to consider that and, and water it, I'd say, every other day for about a month. That's kind of my standard uh, procedure. If it's droughty after that, you might have to continue watering it. But um, every other day, a deep watering, let it really soak into the ground so those roots are trained to go down into the ground to look for the water. You don't want to just moisten the surface a little bit every day because then the roots are going to be trained to be right at the surface. And if you get a drought, then all those roots are up top and they have a hard time finding enough water. So seeds are the opposite, um, but watering is easier because these, these plants are very tiny. They don't need a lot of moisture, so they get a little bit of a root system, they get a little bit of leaf material, and they kind of balance that out as they grow. So they don't need a lot of water except to germinate and just get started. But keep in mind they will be out competed by weeds and they're going to require ma maintenance as far as weed pulling instead of watering at that point. So these are just some plugs that I grew at home to plant so you can see what they look like. And when you're planting plugs like that, 
I don't use a trowel. If I'm planting 2,000 plants in pots, there's no way I'm going to sit on my knees and dig 2,000 holes with a trowel. I use a drill with an auger bit with a 36 inch shaft and a 2 inch diameter or 3 inch diameter. So you can just walk along and you just keep popping holes. And you can pop 1,000 holes in a matter of a few hours and then go back and put your plants in those holes. And the auger bit is sized for that pot. You can buy them in all different sizes. So you don't even have to really adjust the hole at size at all. You just put the plug right in there and you just tuck it in and that's it. You move on to the next one. So planting a thousand plants in the course of a day is not impossible when you have an auger. If you're digging trolls with a trowel, that's impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have a sore back well before you get to a thousand. So another thing you can do is uh, when you smother a site, this is what a lot of people do when they have a lawn right now. I want to make a 100 square foot garden over here. I'm going to put down black plastic. I'm going to put down a tarp. I'm going to put down an old billboard or a rubber pond liner sheet or whatever it might be. Any of those things will work fine. Um, when you take that off the ground, you've got this bare area now where all the grass is dead. There's a bunch of bare soil. All those weed seeds that are sitting in that soil near the surface are now going to be stimulated to germinate from the intense light. A lot of our annual weeds will see intense light and then that's how they know. All right, I'm near the surface, I'm going to start growing. So what we can do is as soon as you take that tarp off, or very quickly afterward, matter of days at least, or if not hours, um, put down something else. In this case, I recommend a half inch to an inch of weed-free compost because you're basically putting a tarp back down. But this is a tarp that plants will grow right through, the plants that you put in. But they're still going to be, the, the compost layer is acting as a tarp to continue blocking the light from the weed seeds below. So in my very crude diagram here, here's the compost. And now you've got this well-lit area on the top that doesn't have weed seeds in it. So the weed seeds below are going to stay dormant and you can plant directly into that compost. It'll be less maintenance later because the weeds are not growing in between your plants. There are going to be a few. They're going to blow in. They're going to be washing in maybe from the rain if it's traveling across the ground. Um, you're going to have a few but it's not going to be nearly the weed pressure that you'd have otherwise if you would have just planted into the open soil. Yes, Carol? Where do you find weed-free compost? Yeah, so um, this is not like a pile of rotting cow manure from your local farm. Um, I've dealt with that before when people say, oh, I'll bring the compost. Um, this is, uh, I get mine mostly from Busy Bee Compost in Mosinee, uh, right along the highway before you get to what is it, right after DB, um, just north of DB. Um, there are other cop op uh, commercial operations. Uh, there's one in Wausau. There's a couple in Milwaukee area. There's different places you can get it. Um, Busy Bee is pretty close, so I just take a trailer up there and I get it. Um, it's not perfectly weed-free. It's right along the highway. There's stuff blowing in, um, but it's pretty good. It's it's He does a good job keeping it up high enough temperature to kill weed seeds, and it's it's pretty good stuff. You could also buy it from the store. Depending on what you buy, it, there may be variation in how weed-free it is. Um, but that would be my recommendation. I don't use my home compost. I just use that in a vegetable garden or, or something like that, or as a soil amendment. Um, I don't use it for gardens because I don't think I do a good enough job killing all the weed seeds in my compost. I would add, I've used compost from Sue's in Wausau, H-S-U is how you Bell, Sue's, and they have a couple different options, and they've worked great. Um, no weeds the first year, at least, not until things started blowing in. Yep. So this is what it could look like. This is when, when we moved into our current house. Uh, two weeks after we moved in, I went a little crazy and transformed 1,400 square feet into native plants. So I had a dump trailer load of compost brought in. Uh, eight cubic yards I think I had brought in and then was able to to uh, cover that area but you can see the tarps are just coming off and I'm starting to put the compost down and then I pulled some more tarp and I put some more compost down and was trying to continuously block the light from those weed seeds. Yes Maria? Yeah, okay, so the question is if you till a site, what happens uh, compared to smothering it? I, I really like smothering for a couple of reasons. One, you don't have any material to get rid of. 
you just leave everything in place. You don't disturb it at all. You just plant right into it or put the compost on the top. If you till it, uh, what that often does is it chops up rhizomes of weeds that are there and every rhizome will then sprout. Um, you get a lot of seeds that are dormant down in the soil. You're bringing those up to the surface and those are then going to sprout. So the weed pressure tends to be worse after you till. Um, and I just have much better luck when you just smother it and you just plant right into that soil. Uh, it's easier to walk into and when you're actually planting, when the soil isn't tilled and all loosened up, uh, it's got some more structure to it. So I don't recommend tilling. I think it's just an unnecessary extra expense and, and effort. I'm all about low effort. <laughs> yeah? Um, what kind of a smothering tarp do you recommend? Good question. Uh, the question is, what kind of tarp do you recommend? Um, don't use blue, don't use green, don't use yellow, silver, any of those colors. Black is the way to go. The heaviest black tarp you can find, it can be silver on one side as long as it's black on the other side. Um, put the black side up and it's got to be black. And no holes in it, not a thin tarp, get the heaviest one you can get. If you can get your hands on rubber pond liner, roof liner, uh, an old billboard, those are awesome. They're heavy rubber, they're heavy to move, but nothing grows through them. They are absolutely pitch black underneath. Um, so just the heaviest, blackest thing you can find to cover the site. You can also use cardboard, a lot of people do that. Um, cardboard with some mulch on top or something thick enough to block all the light. You can then plant into the cardboard later that will work. Um, it's another option. Just make sure you take all the tape and labels and stuff off of the cardboard. Otherwise, you're going to be pulling that out of the garden for years. Hmm. Yeah. But I, I pretty much exclusively use black tarps nowadays. Yeah. Or pond liner. I've got a piece of that, too. All right. Um, keep moist for at least three weeks. Every other day is great. And then if the plants look thirsty later in the season, give them a drink and give them a hard drink. Don't just sprinkle a little bit. Flood them. Let that water just really soak the soil around them. Uh, give them a, a real good drink. And you can use groupings and drifts. These are principles of landscape architecture. A drift is a, a color band that kind of weaves its way through a planting. It basically catches your eye and weaves your, your eye right through the whole planting. Um, that's an aesthetic thing, but it also is really ecologically beneficial because a lot of things we'll see, uh, like take a, a monarch, for example, that's looking for a milkweed. If it sees one milkweed, it might be worth going down there and laying eggs on there. there there's probably enough food for the, a couple of caterpillars to be on there. But if there's a whole bunch of 15 milkweeds in a row, a caterpillar can easily move from one to the next to the next if it needs to, to find additional food. Um, same thing with the color of a flower. To anything that's looking for a nectar source, it's going to be more attracted to a big pile of flowers compared to a single one or a, a big area of a single color. Um, butterflies in particular really like the color purple. So if you have a big drift of purple, then it's more appealing to butterflies that are coming by. Um, the butterfly design is really what we focused on at our, our current house where most of our plantings are designed for butterflies. And don't use pesticides. In this case, you're, you're planting things that are going to be attracting a lot of insects and a lot of birds. You don't want to be using pesticides, killing those insects that are then going to be eaten by the birds and then you're killing birds. Um, try to avoid pesticides whenever possible. Something else I want to mention, uh, these cues to care developed in the, by the University of Minnesota, just some ideas to demonstrate that this is an intentional planting, things that you can do. One of the big things is a border, showing that here is the area that I planted. This is an area that is intentionally planted, it is maintained, uh, it is intentionally a garden. Um, here's the lawn over here, here's my garden, here's where the line is. Um, Gardens just tend to look more intentional when there is some sort of a garden around them. They look more finished and uh, acceptable to most people. Plant shorter plants along anywhere where there's a, a walkway, a driveway, a sidewalk, anything like that. Larger plants are going to want to flop over if there's a heavy rainstorm, windstorm at the end of the season. These plants sometimes might be, you might have some four foot tall plants or five foot tall plants. You don't want them laying across the sidewalk and blocking the sidewalk for people walking by. That's going to be a call to Mark. I can't get down the sidewalk because this nutcase got some <laughs> tall plants that flopped over. 
Um, you don't want to be blocking your driveway so people can't open their door, that sort of thing. So just keep that in mind. Plant some short things along the trails, along sidewalks, along the roads, along the driveways. Yeah. I'll just add one thing to that. Actually, the city does, uh, within the boulevard area, and, and this does come up regularly, uh, there's a 24-inch height restriction. Now, do we enforce that to the letter of the law? No. But um, just today, I drove around, and there's uh, sunflowers planted in the boulevard and corn stalks. So <laughs> those are definitely over 24 inches. So just be mindful of that when you're around the sidewalk, especially in that boulevard area to use lower. And a lot of it's site issues backing out of driveways. Um, as well as just impeding the sidewalk. So just be mindful of that when you're planning what plans to put in those boulevard or sidewalk areas. Yeah, good thought. Yeah. I have another question. You said trim late bloomers to avoid floppy plants in your areas. When, do you, when is a good time to trim those late bloomers like an aster? Yeah. Okay, so the question is when to trim a late blooming species uh, like an aster, goldenrod, things like that. A lot of things in the aster family, the asteraceae family, they bloom later in the season, uh, late August through September into October. And a lot of them do get fairly tall, but what you can do is to trim those back in early July. Uh, for New England aster, for example, this is one that I often trim. It's a really beautiful plant, but it tends to get to four and a half, five feet tall one single plant, few leaves at the top, and a couple of flowers. Well, if you trim it back in July, when it's two feet or two and a half feet tall, you cut it back to maybe 10 inches, then it starts to send out a bunch of side branches. And by the time it's ready to bloom at the end of August, early September, it is two feet, two and a half feet, and it's got 40 flowers on it instead of four, because all these side branches have flowers at the end of each one. So it creates a, a little compact, bushy, aster rather than a tall tend to be floppy uh, aster so i do that all the time generally early june uh, early july mid july is is best for most of those are there other plants like that like the aster that you would do that for? i would say any aster i would do that for um, there's there's a few that are shorter naturally they only grow to a few feet tall they don't need to be trimmed back um, but um, yeah new england aster or many of the other ones. It, if they grow to be four or five feet tall, trimming them back will encourage them to be a shorter, more compact form, and it'll prevent it from blowing over at the late season. Okay, uh, keep year-round interest in mind too. You don't have to necessarily just garden for the summer. A garden can look really interesting and really cool in the winter as well when you incorporate things that have interesting textures, um, berries or seed heads that remain standing. A lot of these dead stems that are left standing that you should leave standing until the springtime have caterpillars inside. A lot of butterflies will spend the winter as a larva or a pupa inside the stem of an old dead plant. And so leaving those standing will allow that next crop of, of butterflies next year. If you cut all those off and you throw them all in the, in the compost site, then you're throwing all that, that life into the compost as well. Um, you'll see birds in there all the time through the winter. They're taking shelter from the cold winds in the winter in the garden. They're finding bugs. They're finding seeds. Um, a lot of things in there, and you'll still see a lot of life throughout the winter in the garden. Uh, one of the cool plants that if you have a little bit of extra moisture, like on the north side of town, the winterberry holly ilex, which is pictured there with the red berries. Winterberry because it holds the berries through the whole winter. They don't taste real good in the winter. They taste good in the spring when it starts to get a little bit warmer and it's right about the time when cedar waxwings are coming back into town and you'll see 50 cedar waxwings come into your yard and they will destroy all the red berries on your winterberry which is cool because that's what's what they're for their bird food is what they should be for so it's really neat to see those for a couple of days and see them take all those berries off but it's beautiful through the whole winter when it gets a little frost on those berries or a little snow on there it looks really really neat out there against the snow so if you're planting for butterflies, uh, I said most of our plantings at my house were done with a butterfly focus. Keep in mind that a lot of butterflies are specialists. We, most people know the story of the monarch and the milkweed. They, they need each other. The, the milkweeds are the only group that monarch butterflies can lay their eggs on. A milkweed um, is not the only species that an adult monarch can take nectar from. It can drink nectar from hundreds of different species. but the caterpillars can only eat the leaves of a milkweed species. 
could be common milkweed that's pictured on the left, it could be swamp milkweed that's pictured on the right, it could be any of the dozen milkweed species that we have that are native to Wisconsin, but it has to be a milkweed. The same is true for something like a painted lady. These can take nectar from all kinds of different flowers. It's uh, taking nectar from a New England aster here, but it can only reproduce on a couple of plants, mostly pearly everlasting, which is pictured on the right. So unless you have that species around, you won't have painted ladies, at least not the full life cycle on your property. They'll have to reproduce somewhere else and then come visit your property. Um, black swallowtails need something in the carrot family. This could be the carrots in your garden. It could be parsley, it could be dill, it could be fennel in your garden. But anything that's native to Wisconsin in the carrot family will also support the caterpillars of black swallowtails. And last example I have is the fritillary butterflies. There's a whole bunch of them in Wisconsin. They're almost monarch sized. They only reproduce on violets. So if you're applying a broadleaf herbicide to your lawn and killing all the violets, you're not going to have any fritillaries around. Um, it's important to leave those violets uh, around for the fritillaries. So a couple of examples now from around town. Madison Elementary is on the northwest side of town. Uh, we have, in this case, this was a, a school planting we wanted to do for for the kids to come out and, and study uh, native plants and study the life cycle of butterflies and things like that. So we had some teachers and some volunteers help with this project. It was 300 square feet. We had eight volunteers helping. We had 300 plants, so it was about one per square foot. And it went from lawn to what you see in the picture here in about two hours with those eight volunteers. We got a sod cutter, cut the sod off. We had a volunteer that wanted the sod, so she had a trailer waiting. We took all the sod away. We had Busy Bee Compost ready with a trailer. I was ready on the phone. As soon as we were about done with the sod cutting, I said, come on down. He dumped it in there. We put all the plugs in, and, and it was done in no time. Um, this is May 18th. And this is August 20th of the same year. So three months later, this is how fast it goes when you use plants that are in pots. If we would have used seeds, we would have spent dozens of hours weeding before it would look like this, and it probably would have taken two to three years. So very quick results. We would have, uh, we knew we were gonna have parents driving through that horseshoe picking up their kids every day after school and they were going to be looking at that garden. They got nothing better to do while they're waiting for their kid to take 20 minutes to come out the door. So they're going to be sitting there looking at that garden judging whether they like it or whether they don't like it and they were going to let us know or let the principal know at least. So we use plugs. Definitely there was an extra expense to that but the results were fast and the results were really good. Um, this is my rain garden at home. So this is August 1st of 2018. The white on the grass is spray paint. We just outlined where we wanted certain things. We were converting about 60% of our front yard from lawn to native plants all at once. Um, so we we're made a plan. And here's the plan instead of on paper, right on the lawn. Uh, I did have a friend help who had a tractor because I was going to be moving a lot of soil. So I didn't really feel like doing it all with a shovel. I had him come over and help. So that was an, an extra expense. I hired him to come over and help out with that. Um, here it is a couple hours later. If you notice in the background, all of my neighbors have carefully maintained manicured lawns. Believe me, there were a lot of people driving really slow down my street, taking pictures, stopping, talking with their passenger, what's going on on this guy's yard? So we had that in mind. We knew it was going to happen. Um, but we, we made sure to talk to every person that came by that wanted to, if they wanted to say anything or ask any questions, we were happy to tell them what, what was going on, this, what's, what is going to be. And we sort of carefully planned this out we, grow, we grew all the plants in pots in the backyard. So the reason we started this in August is because we had 1,500 plants in pots in the backyard that we had grown from seed that were blooming in the pots or ready to bloom. So uh, we, we made all this, all this change to the front yard and then we started planting the next day and we had plants blooming within a week out there. So it was a very quick change and people could start to visualize, okay, this is not just going to be a pile of dirt or weeds. There's, I see what's going to happen here. I see what it's becoming. 
Um, so here it is two, two months later, October 1st. And the only reason we have black-eyed Susans and purple coneflowers blooming in October is because they were growing in pots that whole time and they, were, they weren't ready to bloom in the pot quite, but they were close. And so they're blooming late because they were in pots the rest of the season. But we've got the rain garden is very uh, well developed there. We've got most of the plants in there. We're starting to plant along the berm there on the right side. There's also a berm on the left side of the path that you can't see um, with about 1,400 plants total between them all. Question? I was just going to ask about the life cycle of these natives. You know, when you're planting or, or planting them from seed, growing them late winter, spring, early summer, and now they're out of cycle and you're planting them. No issue. They'll just they'll pick up with the the seasonal change yep. the next year, no issues? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Next year was just a normal year for them. Right. Yeah. Uh, I should repeat the question for the recording. Um, the question was, is the life cycle normal the following year if you put the plants in uh, out of cycle? If I, I plant these things two months later than they would have normally bloomed, are they still going to be on a normal cycle the next year? And the answer is yes. Yeah. Okay, so how am I controlling where the water goes? So the rain garden is designed to uh, have a, a low spot where I wanted the low spot to be. The water is coming out of the downspout primarily. The rest of the lawn is, is very sandy, so we don't really have any runoff coming off of the soil itself collecting anywhere. It just goes right through. But that one downspout, as I said before, is draining over a thousand square feet of rooftop between the house and the garage. It all goes to one uh, four inch downspout. So it's a, a big downspout intentionally conveying a huge amount of water and that's it, it floods the rain garden but well, then why is it not like all right there and those like six feet of plants right around it why wouldn't it how are you making so the, the yeah, okay, so the base of the rain garden is is flat for a little ways. So it's not just a, a cone. It's got a, a, a slope sides and then it's sort of flat at the bottom. And it's about 15 inches deep in the middle. So if when it hits the bottom, it spreads out and kind of fills in that low area and then it starts rising up all the sides. Um, whenever you're making a rain garden, it's important to have an engineered overflow spot. If you do get three inches of rain in 20 minutes, where's that all going to go? You don't want it going back toward the house, so you want the backside away from the house to be an inch or two lower in some spot. And in, in our, our case, uh, at the very right side of the wood mulch that you can see back there, there's sort of a low corner, and it'll overflow there and go over to the river birch, which thanks me for it. It loves it. Loves the extra water. But it just goes out that direction and eventually just soaks into the sandy soil, so we don't, we don't see it get more than a few feet away from the rain garden, even if it does fill. Okay, so this is June 21st. Oh, John. My question, how, is, how did your rain garden do this summer without any rain? Yeah, uh, so uh, another, another point about rain gardens maybe. Rain gardens are not ponds. Uh, they are not wetlands. They are dry. They are basically the same soil conditions that you have anywhere else on your property. It just happens to get water a little more often than the rest of the property. Um, so you don't want to plant wetland plants down in there. I've I've been pushing what I can get to grow in, in my garden, so I do have blue flag iris and burr reeds and sweet flag in there, which are nor wetland species. Um, but I also added 10 inches of compost to the bottom of when I made the rain garden, so I kind of created this big sponge of water down there. Um, so in between rains, it would still hold a lot of moisture. Um, that's not necessary. Just a couple inches of compost at the bottom is perfectly fine. Um, I forgot your question already because I got off on a tangent. Yeah, <laughs> oh, how did it do this year? So this was a terrible year to grow just about anything. Yeah. Uh, the rain garden, I watered the rain garden with a sprinkler probably three times um, because the plants that I put in that were not appropriate for rain gardens, like the sweet flag and the iris, they were really having a hard time because they're supposed to be in a wetland and they're growing in plover sand. Um, not happy. So I didn't want to lose those, so I, I did water them. But um, otherwise, I would the, the rain garden that you plant, you should plant it as if you're planting into any other part of the soil on your property. So the right place for the right, the right plant for the right place applies to you, your whole property, whether it's in a rain garden or not. And if you're planting those fairly dry species into the rain garden, just as you would any other part of the lawn, they'll do fine because they're, they're meant to grow in that sort of a habitat. 
if you're really pushing it like me and you're trying to get certain species to grow just because you like that species, you might have to do a little more maintenance to keep them alive. All right, so uh, here it is, June 21st. This is 10 months after we broke ground on the rain garden. And again, these plants are growing really well and they're huge and they're looking great because they were plugs. They were not grown from seed on the ground. They were grown in a nursery or grown in our backyard in pots. And August 11th, we, I don't know what's going on with that picture there. It's a little funny on the bottom part there, but you can see what it looks like one year after planting. Plants are blooming, they're big, they're healthy, they're vibrant, and they basically have closed up the whole garden so that weed competition is minimized throughout the whole garden, except on the perimeter. And this is the day after that video you saw before where the water was flying out in uh, filling up the rain garden. This is the day after everybody's looking really happy down there, well watered. Uh, nobody got blown over or anything. It just looks like a flower garden again. There's no water sitting in the bottom. Rain gardens typically hold water for a matter of minutes to hours. They're not ponds. They don't hold water for two weeks. They don't breed mosquitoes because there's only water in there for a matter of minutes to hours. Um, so uh, it's just a stormwater infiltration device is really is what it is. And it happens to be a flower garden at the same time. All right, we like to share our garden. This is my daughter and we have, we went and bought five vases after the rain garden started blooming and our neighbors on each side and the three neighbors across the street all got a delivery of fresh flowers every week from a six-year-old girl bringing a vase of flowers and nobody can resist a six-year-old girl bringing them a vase of flowers. So. Uh, well, as I said before, if you get within eight or ten feet of the garden, you start to realize how much life is in there, how beautiful it is. But if you never come over to look at the garden, you don't appreciate it. And so we would bring the garden to them if they aren't coming over. The other thing we did is put a, a path. You saw, sort, sort of saw it in the pictures there. There's a path between the two berms and between the rain garden and the, the left berm. So we encourage people to walk right through. Instead of walking down the driveway, come walk right through the garden. Just get right up in there and come right to the front door. Um, it gets people in there and gets them seeing how there's toads in there and there's dragonflies in there and there's all these cool butterflies hanging around. Um, so yeah, we tried to share it as much as we, we can. And I've got lots more stories about that, but I don't want to keep you here all night. So uh, I want to talk about shoreline gardens. If you're on a lake shore, if you're on a river, um, there are certain things you want to keep in mind. First of all, Wisconsin native perennial plants are best. These big fibrous rooted perennials, most of what I'm talking about so far today is perennial species. I'm not really talking about annuals. But in this case, we've got a common black eyed Susan plug here that I grew at home. It's got this huge fibrous root system already developed in that pot. Those big fibrous roots hold a lot of soil together and they will hold the bank together on the lake or on the river shore. Mixing in some sedges and grasses are a good idea too. When I say forb, or you see forb on the slide, a forb means basically it's not a rush or a sedge or a grass. It's a big flowering plant, what you'd think of as a wildflower. Um, those are great. They're very pretty. Sedges and grasses have gigantic fibrous root systems, so they're really important to hold soil together. They do a great job holding banks together on, on uh, lake shores and river shores. Um, especially along the water's edge where erosion is the biggest concern, plant a lot of those fibrous species along the lake shore. Um, don't excavate. Using a drill is okay, but don't go in there with a shovel and go till and turn a bunch of soil over because that's going to wash into the river or into the lake. It's going to destabilize the shore. That's not a good idea and the Land Conservation Department will not be happy about it either. Um, Tracy Arnold was going to be here. She had another obligation, but she's from the Land Conservation Office. I've got her email address at the end of the presentation here. So if you are along a lake shore or river shore and you need to see if there's a permit involved or anything like that, uh, you can contact Tracy and she'll let you know if you need to think about anything like that. Okay, so this is Piffner Park. This is the north part of Piffner Park near the boat slips and near the little boat landing at the end of Franklin Street. This is the garden that Amber Lee mentioned earlier. It's kind of one of our demonstration gardens from the Wild Ones chapter. We worked with the City of Stevens Point Parks Department on this one. It was originally going to be, uh, if you go about halfway down that, that tarped area there and then keep going all the way to the back, that was the original area. When somebody tarped it, 
they actually started at the right spot, but they went the wrong direction. <laughs> so we ended up making this twice as big as it was originally planned to be, which is fine. We were happy to do that. So it was about 180 feet long, I think, um, and about nine feet wide on average. So a lot of plants went in there. We put about 1,500, 1,600 plants in there. Uh, has anyone seen this garden in bloom this summer? It looked awesome. Yeah, right along the Green Circle Trail, right along the river there. Um, it, yeah, it was awesome. We, we started tarping it. This is black plastic with sandbags on top. We started that right after the snow was gone in, um, I think that was the first week of April that we, st we put that down. And we tarped it until the second week of May, which is when we planted. So it only had six weeks, but that was enough time for it to heat up and kill everything underneath. There's a little bit of grass you can see along the path that wasn't covered. We still have a little bit of turf grass that's sort of hanging out in there. It's not really causing any problems, so we don't really manage that so much. Uh, we just go through and we weed it a little bit once in a while, and it's, it's a once a year thing. It takes us probably two hours with a group of three or four people to weed that 180 feet. So um, it's, it grows densely and it really doesn't have much for a weed competition. So here it is later that same year, this is the end of the same season, blooming, doing great. Um, and as many of you have seen, it, it looks really, really nice. It does a great job holding the soil together. The original purpose of this garden was that the city was concerned about the erosion. Uh, throughout Piffner Park, if you walk along the green circle, bike along the green circle, you see the path gets closer and closer to the river every year. And there are spots where the path is only two feet from the river now. And the only places where the bank is still a decent distance away from, um, from the path is where there's a tree. The tree is holding all the soil together. So you see the shoreline cut way in and then there's a tree. And then it cuts way in toward the path and then there's another tree. And all that space where there's just lawn is just constantly getting eroded. It's falling into the river and it's eroding back toward the path. So in this place, uh, this part of the park here, the erosion concern is pretty much gone now. Those plants have huge deep root systems. They're holding the bank together. And uh, the next step is now doing it again further down the, the shoreline and, and continuing on with this. Yeah, Trevor. When, where is that going to happen? When and where is the next garden going to happen? Uh, we have been talking with the Parks Department. They are interested in doing a master plan for Piffner Park. As you can imagine, they get about 50 different ideas of how the park should look. And um, they, they don't want to do anything until the master plan is done and all the community input is in and all that sort of thing. So um, they have been hearing that there's a lot of interest in more native plantings along the shore. They've been getting good feedback on this one. So uh, they like the idea, but they're still going to wait until the end of that planning process to do anything else. Um, we have had people offer to donate money toward the next one, donate time toward the next one. A lot of people want to help. They want to see this go much further down the shoreline. Um, one thing I wanted to point out on this one is there's uh, a few things we, we worked into the criteria here. Many of you were on the tours earlier this summer, so you saw this in person. Um, but we planted mostly things that were less than three feet tall. So you could walk down the trail and you could look right over and still see a view of the river. And then along the trail is mostly nodding onion and a couple of short sedges that are only a foot or two tall. So if they do flop over the trail, it's only covering a tiny piece of the edge of the trail. It's not actually getting in the way of people that are using the trail. All right, uh, a couple more things I want to go through. One is starting native seeds. If you do have your own seed source or you want to order seed, how can you get these things going on your own? Um, first of all, we got to define what stratification is. This is a system that you have to overcome in order to germinate seeds. So a seed has a built-in resistance to germinate. If you have a plant that goes to seed in June, it doesn't want to germinate in August because then it's gonna die from frost a month later. It wants to germinate the next year. So it has this process it needs to go to in order to weaken the seed coat and allow it to germinate later. So uh, early germination means death for a seedling. It's gotta wait until the next season. When you order seeds from a supplier, you're gonna see germination codes on something, um, two websites that you might go to, a prairie nursery or prairiemoonnursery.com. Either one of those are big native plant suppliers. They will have these codes. Uh, a, for example, means that you can just throw these seeds out and they'll germinate. They don't really have a stratification procedure. They just go. Uh, another one that you'll see is a C followed by a number. C means cold, moist stratification, and the number means the number of days that they need to go through that cold, moist period before they'll germinate. 
So a C30 needs to either sit in the fridge for 30 days in a, a moist environment or it needs to go outside under the snow or something like that to uh, go through that process. So you'll see it on, the, on a website, you'll see it listed, C30 for example here. This is what I do at home. Um, my wife doesn't want all these bags of seeds sitting in the fridge for the whole winter, so I do it outside. I let Mother Nature do it for me. Um, what I do is I bury them under the snow. I seed trays with seed. I put potting mix in the tray. I seed over the top, put a little dusting of soil on the top, move on to the next tray. I do a whole bunch of them and I lay them under the snow with a, a wire rack around them. You'll kind of see that as I uncover it here in the, in the slideshow. And I put a tarp over the top and I cover that in snow. The first time it snows, I go out there with a shovel and I throw a whole bunch on there. And it just sits under the snow and it naturally stratifies right along the ground in the cold, moist environment that's just naturally out there. Um, that's an easy way to do it and then when you're ready to bring them inside you can bring them in put them under lights in the spring if you want you can just put them out on a rack in the spring and let them germinate when they're ready however you want to do it is is fine so I take the the snow and the tarp off when I'm ready to start the seeds I've got a couple of racks that I grow them on in the summer so I put those racks on the ground one upside down and then put the trays inside put the top rack on top of that and then the squirrels can't get in so they can't go digging in my seed trays that I just uh, put in there before the, uh, before the snow falls. And then I cover it with a tarp, put snow on top, and then we're all well set to go. So I take the trays out and then I pull them inside and start them under some lights. Um, this is what they'll look like uh, maybe four weeks later or so. And as far as when to start them, if you go to uh, Junk's and you look for some, some tomato seeds or pepper seeds, it'll say right on the packet, five weeks or six weeks before the last frost, this is when you should start your pepper seeds, and then you can move them outside. That wasn't really known much for native plants, but uh, being the nerd that I am, I started about 110 species over the winter under lights and uh, kind of tracked them throughout time. And I, I've found that with almost all of the native perennials, five to six weeks ahead of time is perfect. They'll be at a good stage at that point to move them outside. So if you are gonna start them inside, five to six weeks is a good time to grow them. Make sure you do have intense lights don't just put an incandescent light bulb over the top. It's not going to do anything. They're going to be really skinny and weak. Um, put a big shop light or something over the top. It doesn't necessarily have to be ex an expensive grow light. It could just be a, an intense LED shop light from Menards or somewhere. Um, I did some tests with that too, and the shop light did just fine. So you don't have to spend a ton of money on it. Um, here's an example of what it'll look like. So after 17 days after germination, a smooth blue aster is still only three quarters of an inch tall. So it needs a little bit more time before you move it outside. Uh, 22 days, it's about an inch. 44 days, about three inches tall. And then after almost two months, it's, this is a big, strong plant that's ready to go outside. Paul, when you said five to six weeks, is that five to six weeks before the last frost? Yes, or whatever time you're planning on planting. Maybe you're planning on planting first weekend of June or something like that. You'd want to start it five to six weeks before that time. Um, the last frost typically is the second week to third week of May in, in our area, so keep that in mind if you're starting things. Don't start anything before April 1st because chances are it's going to be really leggy and skinny and weak by the time it's ready to actually go outside after the frost is done. So last thing I want to talk about is some recommendations for what you might want to plant. Things that I like to plant that I, I use a lot because I, I have good success with them and I think they're really uh, good native landscaping choices. One is the nodding onion. It's a short plant, less than a foot tall. Gets a really neat little umbrella shaped flower of uh, uh, flower head of pink flowers. Smells nice. If you do have to trim it back, it smells like onions. Um, Lots of little bees will use it. You'll see a lot of the really tiny bees on there, completely harmless bees, but um, they like to visit the onions. Rabbits don't like them. Deer don't like them. So that's a big plus. Uh, it makes a really nice border plant along the edge of a garden or along a walkway or a driveway, anything like that, because it's so small. Um, very easy to grow from seed and you can actually let them just sit there all winter. The seed heads will hold the seeds through most of the winter as long as the birds haven't all eaten them yet. You can go out there in February and you can collect the seeds right off the seed head and just throw them into a tray and start them. Uh, they'll st stratify naturally outside right above the snow. 
Uh, Ohio spider wart is a nice one just because I really like the blue color. There's not a lot of really vibrant blue flowers, um, so I like it for that reason. But it likes dry soil. It can tolerate the driest of conditions that you throw at it. Butterfly milkweed is a similar species. It likes to be in dry sites. So dry, sandy areas, lots of sun, it'll take that. It's about two, two and a half feet tall and has an orange flower head. Most milkweeds are pink. This one happens to be orange. So it's a, a real striking color in the garden. Couple more, the pale purple coneflower. This is a threatened species in Wisconsin, so it's not common in the wild. Uh, it's also the, the official flower of wild ones. So on our logo, you see a pale purple coneflower. So I like using that one, especially in our wild ones gardens. And then purple coneflower is one that is very common. People know this one. If you've grown any flowers, you've probably grown a purple coneflower. Um, this one is not native to Wisconsin. It's native within about 50 miles of Wisconsin. So in my opinion, it's close enough. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, it's a really pretty flower. It's very attractive. It's very attractive to butterflies and birds and people. Uh, it has so many advantages that I, I like to use it a lot. It's also easy to grow and it's versatile in where it will grow and easy to grow from seed. A really unique plant that does well in dry sites is Rattlesnake Master. Uh, Eryngium is the genus that if you might have grown an Eryngium that's a cultivar. Um, this one goes to maybe three and a half feet tall. It's a little bit taller, but it's, it's just a really weird, unique looking plant that catches a lot of attention. So I like to use that one too. And believe it or not, it is in the carrot family. It doesn't look anything like most carrots, but a black swallowtail can lay eggs on this species because it is in the right family. All right, so then uh, moist sites, Bebs sedge is one that we use a lot. It's one that we used in the Piffner Garden along the trail because it only gets to about a foot tall. It's a, a more moist soil species, but it stays short. So again, a good border species or anything along a, a walkway or path. Columbine is one that most people know. This is a fairly easy one to grow. It does like part shade or it likes a little bit of extra moisture or both. Don't put it in the full sun in the sand. It's not gonna be real happy there, but if you can give it a little more moisture or some shading on the base of the plant it'll be happy about that and then meadow blazing star this is what my yard looks like right now monarchs all over the place because I have about yeah I've got about 20 or so of these blooming right now and it's not uncommon to be this week to have 10 or 15 monarchs at a time in the yard because they really love this plant uh, other blazing stars, this is the genus Liatris. Um, a lot of them are, are attractive to a lot of different wildlife, but the monarchs in particular really like this particular species. Um, but you need more moisture. Don't, you can't grow it in sand. It's not happy there. It likes to be on the north side here. It's great. It's perfect soil conditions for the meadow blazing star. And then swamp milkweed is a good one. Uh, it doesn't really need a swamp. It doesn't have to be super wet. As long as there's some moisture in the soil, it's pretty happy. Uh, just don't plant it in sand again. Blue iris is a wetland species. If you have a really wet spot where there's actually standing water, if you dig a hole a foot deep, that's a good spot for a blue iris, but um, it does need quite a bit of moisture. It will survive in a wide variety of habitats, but it'll only bloom if there's a lot of moisture. And that's one of the big reasons to plant a blue iris. They're really pretty, you want them to bloom. Wild geranium is one that likes more moisture, but also does well in shade. So if you have a shade garden or a shady part of a garden that you're looking for, wild geranium is a, a good choice for that. Okay, I think this is my last one. Um, New England Aster, I talked about that one a little bit before. It's a late bloomer, it'll bloom until the frost. So it starts blooming about now, it'll be blooming until early October. It's also one you can cut back if you don't want it to be as tall and you want a more compact, bushy form. Bottle gentian is blue. That's why I like it. Super cool blue. Um, it's only pollinated by the largest of bumblebees also. The flowers never actually open. It's just a big tubular flower that's got a little hole at the end. And a bumblebee has to force its way in. So you'll see the, the flower will open a little bit. The bee will go in. Then it'll close up around the bee. And you'll just see the flowers just in there shaking because <laughs> the bumblebee's inside. Um, so that's just fun to watch. And then Joe Pieweed is a cool accent plant. If you want to have a really tall, striking plant in the middle of a garden, Joe Pie is a really cool one. It does get to be about five feet tall. Uh, so it is big and those flower heads can be on one stem. That flower head, as you see in the picture, could be 10 inches across. And it might have 
30 stems on a clump. So it can be a pretty impressive plant. Okay, I've talked long enough. Here's some contact info if you want to contact me or Amber Lee or Mark or uh, Chris or Tracy from the Land Conservation Department. You can write down some emails. Um, we had mentioned if you want to talk individually about your site or show us a soil sample or whatever, um, Amber Lee and I can walk around and we can offer some advice. But I think uh, most of you probably are going to take off. So if you have any questions, we can take questions first and then we can wander around with individual people after that. Yeah, back there. How do you deal with invasive species? Because I have a huge issue dealing with Asian bittersweet mm -hmm. in my garden, and I cannot get rid of it. The roots that we pulled out last fall were about this big around, and it's still everywhere. Yeah. I don't want to kill it with the herbicide because it's going to kill everything else in my garden. Yeah, so I don't have to deal with bittersweet, thankfully. I have many other invasives I have to deal with from neighboring properties. Um, but sometimes you do have to go to a little bit of an extreme to get rid of that invasive first and then start over in that, that spot. You maybe don't have to take the whole garden out, but that's, that spot, you might have to do an herbicide treatment. It might be the only way to get rid of something that's really nasty, like a bittersweet. Um, Sometimes hand pulling and trimming and stuff just isn't going to cut it. Yeah, so it's uh, it's it's different between every species. Bittersweet is one of the worst ones that you'll have to deal with because of those root systems that you mentioned. Yeah. Do do any of these um, when you're setting up a garden? Do you need to be concerned about calling for your spot or anything like that? Yeah, I would recommend doing that. Uh, usually the utilities are buried a couple feet down or more, so it's uh, you, if you're just taking a shovel, you're probably not going to hit something, but it's a good idea anyway just to call it, see where your utilities are, um, and see how far down they are. We did hit a line in the back of my yard right along the lot line. There, It was shallower than it was supposed to be, um, but it was just with a, a hand shovel, and so they're, they're kind of designed to take some abuse from people just digging with a shovel. It's not, you don't want to excavate there or something. Um, but definitely call Digger's Highline first. Just be sure where the utility lines are. Yeah. I've been planning for the location of the garden. Um, I do have the golf course neighbor. I <laughs> use a lot of um, pesticides and herbicides, and I'm concerned about like putting all the bees and butterflies along there. Is that a concern? Where they're going to be like getting that like drift of <laughs> chemicals? Is it okay to plant there, or would it be better to? Yeah, so uh, I forgot to repeat the other couple of questions, but the question was, if, should I be planting flowers to attract bees and things right along the lot line where there's pesticides being applied on, on the other side? Um, it is a concern. You could have drift over there. Uh, you could talk to the neighbor and try to get them to be kind of careful about where that's going. Um, don't just broadcast it willy-nilly over there and, and accidentally spray a bunch of your plants. Uh, if you have a different site you could use, that might be a better way to go for the sake of the butterflies and things that will be coming in there. Um, there is definitely a chance and really it's it's up to the, the other landowner about how much of a risk that is. There's not much that, that you can do um, um, short of moving it to a different spot. I would add another option if the the neighbor just isn't going to not spray and you really want to put it in that area, you could plant a shrub barrier, like something to catch that drift to prevent it from coming into your, your part of the yard. Yeah. I have a question. You talk about this, the native tree, shrubs, and plants, and how does that get developed within our landscape design? Um, I know the emphasis is on the plants, the, the forbs for butterflies, but I think this is kind of an important uh, area that the city or we as people could look at. Sure. So the question is how can we incorporate shrubs and trees into the landscape as well? Um, tonight we were kind of focused on 
the lawnscape, the native plants, um, but shrubs and trees are definitely important. They provide a lot of structure to a landscape. They provide a ton of food and, and uh, flowers and seeds for birds and a lot of things like that. So they have a huge value, but we were just focused on the more herbaceous stuff for tonight. Um, I can also add just, oh. I can add just for uh, shrubs and things like of that nature, we, I mean, you can still landscape your yard normally. If you decide to, you know, implement Long Gone Native, does not ex exclude you from doing, you know, planting annuals or anything or planting shrubs or bushes or trees? That's still something that you can do. Um, our concern more so is making sure that regulations are still followed so you don't want a, like a bush overgrowing into the sidewalk. That's really it. We're just making sure that it's contained within your property. This is, but Long Gone Native is more so to uh, remove, yeah, yeah, remove your grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how long is a submitted plan good for? So like I'm at a house, I might move away in three years, and I want to make sure that I'm not settling that person with something that they're going to have to get rid of in three years. Yeah, so what happens is when you submit the plan, and we haven't done a lot of these, um, but when we submit a plan, uh, I just make sure it meets the basic ordinance requirements. And sometimes there are some questions, depending on who's done the plan. And um, I mean, my goal is to work with you. Let me first and foremost say that. Uh, so once the plan's approved, you actually get a unique number that's a, a, within our system that's a, a perpetual case. So that stays open indefinitely. Now, if that new owner moves in and wants to you know, not all they have to do is let us know, and we can we can close that case at that point. But if ownership changes automatically within our system, that's going to change. It's going to transfer the new ownership. Um, I can say from personal experience, it seems that many of the people that buy homes with native well, that's a selling point from what we've seen. It's not that I I can't think of a single experience where somebody's bought a property that's had a nice uh, native lawnscape and went in and, and kind of destroyed it to put in a golf course. It just I, I can't think of a single one where that's happened. So. Can it happen? Yeah, all they have to do is, is make a call and, and we can we can void that uh, approval pretty easily. But it's to answer your question, it stays going indefinitely and it transfers ownership automatically. Um, now, if it's a tenant issue, if there's like you have rental property, I know there are some people who have rental properties, um, that tenant, and we have had a situation where a tenant wanted to do a native lawn, a tenant has to, because the, the approval goes to the landowner. So a tenant can do it, but it has to have the landowner, the, the property owner's approval. So um, again, we're willing to work with anybody in the situation, um, but that, that's generally how it works in the city of Stevens Point. And just to, sorry, just to piggyback off that, when you are selling a home, a lot of title companies submit for a special assessment letter. Um, you know, SAL process within the city goes to every single department, ours as well. So because it's entered into our system and it's a perpetual case, they would be noted even if for whatever reason, you didn't mention anything about Long Gone Native, they would still know about it because the case is open. Since it's perpetual, it would be noted that there's an open case, the number associated with that, so they would have that information uh, even if you know those property would have transferred. So long as the title company did do a special assessment letter, most, most title companies do. Um, we also include uh, open building permits on that as well. Yeah, that's a really good point, Maria. So we haven't had the ability to assign, because the ordinance just got adopted in uh, April of, of last year, we haven't had any sales that have had a native lawn, but ultimately uh, what will happen is the title company will actually get a, a, a number, the unique number that's assigned to that, and I would actually provide a copy of that plan so that owner has you know, the ability at that point to say, well, no, I don't want to do this, or, or yes, I'm going to comply with this plan that's been submitted. Um, so they would be aware of it, and I didn't, that's, that's a good catch, Maria. Um, so the, yeah, from this point forward, anybody that has a plan that's been approved, if there's a sale, the new owner is going to actually be made aware of it as part of that transfer process. Thank you. Okay. Do you have a plan template, or what's the uh, outline for the plan? And then the uh, second question is, do you need a plan if you're just doing a garden, or is the plan if you're so, doing your entire lawn? So I'm going to try to answer your question the best I can, and Maria, you can jump in if you need to. Do you want to um, repeat the question, Mark? Oh, yeah. The question was, uh, what is, do we have a template? I think that was question number one. And then do we need something just for a garden? For a garden, no. It's any time you want to exceed our turf grass standard, the turf grass standard is eight inches. So unless you have a plan in place, uh, we're going to hold you to that standard. And obviously, there's pl people that have had native lawns in place long before this ordinance went into effect, and we just consider them grandfathered in. 
Um, but ultimately, you know, gardens, things like that, uh, I, I'm not worried about those if it's, if it's just, the biggest violators are, are people are just letting their grass grow and don't have a plan or calling it a native lawn. I mean, quite honestly, that's, that's, that's why I get calls, I go out, do enforcement. Somebody says, yeah, I want to do the, the plan. That's fine. Uh, we, we actually, on our website, we have four templates based on your soil type and whether it's uh, wet or dry soils, I mm. believe. Yeah, I, there is uh, copies of them up front uh, by the document center over there. Um, but yeah, just, so I think the template it's more of a guide on what you, things you should be considering when you are wanting to design your yard. Um, we don't require like a specific form necessarily be filled out, so it could be given to us in a variety of ways. If you'd want to essentially draw it out, pencil, I mean, you could draft it on a computer. We just want to know where these plants are. If we get a complaint, we can go there and say, oh, that's not a weed or, you know, an invasive species. It's just a plant. So we can then go to the complaint and say, it's a native plant. Yeah. This is what it is. So that's more so, you know, dealing with the code enforcement aspect of it. If you'd want to have an actual aerial view of your property um, and essentially uh, go over it yourself whether it's you know markers or whatever you want or just have it as like a digital file so then you can manipulate that as well we can provide that aerial to you or we can print one at our department we can print it up to like 11 by 17 if you'd want to you know come in or we can send you that as a digital file again that's county gis data publicly known, you can look up the whole city, look up all the parcels. The one benefit of getting a GIS or aerial or using that when you're planting is that there's, you can generally see more like the approximate pro property boundaries and it's important because some areas in the city have a wider right of way than what you may think. So there are places in the city that have a very, very large right of way. It could be someone's entire yard. Uh, we have had those uh, especially in the older uh, part of town uh, by the university, they have very short front yards. So you could, what you think might be your front yard could potentially be city right of way. And so what happens with that is it's similar to the right of way for the boulevard. Plantings can only be two feet in height and below. Those things are also regulated. And of course, planting in the boulevard or, and or the right of way areas essentially are at your risk just because the engineer it's city property engineering department public works department does have purview if they're doing a street reconstruction i mean they could come in and just you know tear it out at their convenience so just making sure that when you're planting in the right of way just know that you do so at your own risk we could always contact the engineering department and ask them what is is there any perspective like reconstruction occurring in my area and they would be able to tell you if it's within the next like five or so years so you would know whether they're coming through or not uh, additionally planting in the right of way you essentially could you qualify to submit for planting a tree so you can request uh, a tree be planted from the forestry department you can there's a list of trees that are available that you can choose from. They plant about 100 trees in the spring and then 100 more trees in the fall. And this is at zero cost to you. Uh, you do have, you are, you are needing to water it. So if you are requesting a tree, you need to maintain the tree. You cannot prune the tree. You essentially can't, you know, like manipulate it in any way. But, you know, if we have uh, fruit bearing trees, we have a lot of different interesting trees that provide, you know, like winter interest, you can always request your more preferred trees but of course you know when planting in the right of way uh, the forestry department does look at the surrounding area if there's too much of one tree you know they also don't want that area to be overloaded with one single tree they want to make sure that your selections if selected do make sense for that area so that includes you know if they have a giant root system they don't want it to buckle into the sidewalk um, underneath and then that's an additional maintenance cost so all those things uh, do require a site visit so if you all you have to do is call the forestry department or submit a form and you know they schedule it with you they come out they look at it and then you essentially get placed on the schedule there is a budget for it so the sooner you get that request in the more likely you'll be able to essentially get in line and get your tree um, but of course the conditions have to be right for that area so within the faq there are um, it's segmented by department areas that they regulate conditions that they might have this includes the forestry department includes engineering public works if you're planting in the right-of-way permitting needs at there's no cost currently for right-of-way permits they just want to know that 
things are happening there. You know, had the person with the corn in the right of way said, hey, I'm planting corn, in the right of way, they would be saying, no, you're not. Um, so these are ways for us to capture and hopefully prevent enforcement needs uh, later on um, down the line if we get a complaint or we happen upon it. So again, that FEQ does go through every department. If there are, if they are somehow related to Lawns Gone Native, this is streets department with like composting, uh, disposing of weeds. Um, if you want to burn your weeds, like burn regulations, the fire department's involved, like if you get into neighbor disputes o over cutting trees along uh, the shared property line, like how PD is involved and what is what we do and do not do in terms of mitigating, you know, neighbors and things like that. So. Take a look at the FAQ. Um, there's a lot of information there. One of the additional resources, someone mentioned Digger's Hotline, that's on there. There are some additional UW extension resources in terms of identifying uh, plants, um, bugs, things like that. Soil testing, those are also on, in the FAQ. There are some additional handouts at the front. Um, those handouts that had just like suggestions for like summer flowers, fall flowers, those are from the Wisconsin DNR site. That's also linked back there. So there's a lot of resources that we have just passively uh, in the community and at a state level that you can always take advantage of for essentially free information. We also are forming a list of mentors who would be able to partner with you specifically for your property um, going forward. So in that information, you know, getting on the list for mentorship, that's also in the FAQ. So there's a lot of stuff in the FAQ if you want to take a look at it, read through. If you have any questions, uh, contact our department. I'm sorry if there was a question and <laughs> forgot it. <laughs> I, I, I think quite simply to answer your question, uh, the plans I get are two pages. They're a plan view and then a, a narrative portion. And they're, they're very cr crude. I mean, one step above like a bar napkin. So if you can do that, you know, that, that's good enough for me. So some color blocks on a, a aerial is great and then a little bit of narrative as to what you're going to do. They don't have to be anything professional. Mm -hmm. So Mark, on that same question, I've gotten questions about this regarding Lawns Gone Native. Mm -hmm. um, anybody can plant a vegetable garden above eight inches tall or put a couple of ornamental grasses out that are clearly more than eight inches tall. So at what point do you need to submit a plan or is it just a way that I'm, it's not a bad idea to submit a plan. You might as well, because then if there's a complaint, then we've got something to go. Yeah, on. you know, really, uh, this boils down to complaint basis. Uh, if, if in a perfect world, I would like to say that anybody wants to plant a native uh, lawn can do it. We, we kind of that was kind of the wild west. The problem is, uh, I do get people that push the issue. I do get people that contacted their electo elected officials, and they start pushing. And you know the, the letter of the law, when it comes down to it, what I have to enforce says you can't have that. So uh, I've had to go into some pretty um, uncomfortable situations, and, and you know uh, we put this together proactively, and you were part of that, and, and you know part, part of what Wild Ones is doing nationwide is educating municipalities that it's it's not just eight inch turf grass. You have to incorporate this because uh, ultimately. When, when I'm enforcing these codes, I, have to, I, can't, I can't do what I think is right. I have to do what's in, in that code. So part of that was changing our ordinance to fit what fits the real world and, and represents all the parties. So it's, it's, I do get some pushback from some people that don't want to submit a plan for whatever reason. I respect that. But I try to educate them that's for their own interest because I'm there to represent, you know, I'm there to take the plan and uh, educate the person that's making the complaint on, on why they're in compliance with the plan. Yeah. And, and so for me, it's a tool to help the landowner mm -hmm. or property owner. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and you brought up a good point that letting your lawn just grow and not mowing it anymore is not a native lawn. <laughs> that's not native landscaping. That's just a bunch of junk growing in your lawn. Um, there may be a couple of good things in there, but that's, that's the kind of thing that's going to probably generate complaints that Mark mm -hmm. is then going to have to get in, involved in. Yeah, Trevor. Yeah, so first, thank you all for doing this. This is pretty exciting, and I think all of us in this room would agree we want to see this accelerate <laughs> throughout the city. Uh, to help that and even make it easier for Mark's job, uh, I'm curious what the education plan is. So we've got the materials, we've got this awesome workshop. Uh, even if we don't win the grant, is there a plan for more education for both the positive as well as the negative of the highly 
recommend pure golf course at all. Well, we haven't really talked much about that. I think a lot of us here know these things, but just like you're saying, there's the opposite side, the opposite spectrum, but they just might not know what's happening in the soil. <laughs> you know, the education, I think, is really, really key to help the community move along. Sure. Do you mean like education of the not in my yard, literally, or? <laughs> Uh, no, not necessarily. It's more of education of um, negative aspects of applying this type of fertilizer or sure. applying this herbicide. Okay. What it does to this type of butterfly. What studies have shown with the water down the Wisconsin River, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. We have a, I think, a lot of resources here locally for that. Yeah, and I think like you pretty much hit the nail on the head there. We have a lot of local resources, especially with the university like UWSP, and just you know I think our community is really invested in something like this. Um, I and it's funny because this the thought process all kind of started from the Nomo May, so you know which is a fun thing to do, but I mean is it does it really have like what is the real impact here? You want to garner large long-term impact over time. So we saw that the more, okay, the long, uh, Nomo May was just like, okay, yeah, fine. Um, but peop just having it be an event within the city had a lot of people talking. What is this? Why? You know, just continuing. So this is just essentially just picking up on that momentum and slowly building on it. So yeah, Long Gone Native is fairly new, um, very new <laughs> this season. But our expectation is like the sky's the limit. Like we're going to continue moving on. We have people who are contacting us, essentially saying, "I love this. I'm interested. Either this is my profession or my hobby, or I have experience in this. How do I help?" so many volunteers willing to you know step up and bridge a knowledge gap um you know we have had people that said we're willing to do site visits come there like you know things of that nature and volunteer their time and their knowledge and their experience um with helping us get the we don't know about you know we're just like you can't do that you know but we want to promote what you can do and what you can do above and beyond of just having you know like a flower garden or like a vegetable garden because you can fit so many other items in there like you know in terms of like food scarcity uh not for humans also for humans but you know animals um nature generally so there's a lot of things that we can do nothing's off the table trevor like we are willing to just like you know we really want to run with it there's a lot of interest there's a lot of momentum um we definitely want to continue harboring that and as a so part of the no mo may situation when that was announced we had uh, signs donated you've seen the b sign um and I just, we needed like another person in the office just to feel, how do I get a sign? You know, it's just like, okay, it's it's such a silly thing, but it had people talking and, you know, there's like news about it, it was on the TV or whatever, the radio, everyone's talking about it. We have other municipalities calling us like, what's Nomo May? Like, what's Long Gone Native? You know, like, so other municipalities are noticing what we're doing within the city. You know, um, Chris, who couldn't be here today, off the cuff said, oh, like, are you ex like, are you ready to first students point to me with this colorful city in, like, you know, uh, the United States? And I'm just like, haha. But I'm like, you know, it's not far off. Who knows? You know, because part of the ongoing process, we are getting in with the signage. So the in-progress signage, what is that? What are we going to have on there? We're going to be looking back to our website with QR codes, um, you know. We're going to continue the workshop situations. Like, can we focus on specific items or points of topic over the over those workshops? Of course, we can talk about you know pesticide use, fertilizer use, uh, other things like that. Like, nothing is really off the table. So we do. This is great start, but there's a lot of a lot more things that we can get into. Going yeah, forward. and and the only thing I would add to that is, um, well. Probably most of us in this room are in agreement there are negative impacts. There are people that are very tied to their manicured lawns, and they have very strong feelings about that. So uh, I believe uh, our approach right now is to more focus on the positive with the native lawns and bringing awareness to it, the signage, uh, the QR code, just getting people talking. Why are you doing it? You know, your neighbors stop by, you talk to them. Well, that probably made a 
heck of a difference because when you stop and talk to them, tell them what you're doing, well, then they have interest in it versus saying, well, what you're doing is bad. Right. You know, we're, I think what we're, we're looking at is focusing on the positive. The other thing is the response has been tremendous. Mm -hmm. and we've actually been overwhelmed by the response to this. And I'm not sure there's any other community in Wisconsin that's even doing a program like this that's, that's really actively involved or the city's actively involved. So this is forward thinking. But to go back to your point, Trevor, contact your elected officials. Let them know how you feel. Contact the mayor's office. Let them know how you feel. Contact the parks department. Let them know how you feel about the restorations they're doing. And, and you know, but this has to be a valuable part of everything the city does. You know, everybody that lives in the city of Stevens Point, you're a constituent, you're a voter. And you know, if you've went to the, any of these public meetings, which a lot of you have, the squeakiest wheel is the one that gets the oil. So, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, make those phone calls and make your feelings known. Yeah, and I think like just having uh, more outspoken outreach, not just from us, you know, we we can do what we can, but you know, talk to your neighbors like, hey, did you hear about this program? You know, this is what's occurring, or these are the efforts that the city is taking, and you know, everyone else is taking to address you know just native habitats, but. I think we haven't even gotten into the process of, you know, like, hey, Sentry, um, did you hear we have this great program that could really use some funding? That really helps us when the community is saying, this is great. How do we do more? That gives us a lot of uh, push to, and, you know, just like, hey, you've heard of this program. It's really popular. Do you want your name on that? And it's just for fielding, like, you know, sponsorships. There's, again, it's just new this year. We're open to going wherever this takes us. Um, we will continue building on it as the years, you know, pass by. Um, of course, you know, through our survey, we're going to start asking you questions. What do you want to see specifically? We'll t we want to hear from you. What is your feedback? Not just on, you know, workshops. What more information would you want to know? Are there certain topics? that you want to specifically focus on. And essentially, we're taking that data and saying, how can we make this happen? Yeah, the surveys, I, I think that's worth mentioning. You, you will all get a survey. Please fill it out. We will absolutely use that data and that information to guide this. And you know, nobody wants to see us. Well, we're learning as we go. You know, we did this, and the response has been tremendous. And we're just going to keep, keep going as far as we can with it. Yeah, and I think I know we don't have a lot of time for your eight o'clock uh, limit. I know I think there was a couple folks that brought in soils. I think you definitely would want them looked at um, before you leave tonight. But if there's any individual questions, I know we kind of went over on our uh, presentation bit. But just know that you know for folks that want to start planning their actual landscape for this upcoming year or want to start you know at least you have some resources to get going whether it's prepping your site in terms of um, drafting a plan you know contact our department we'll get you that aerial just to get you started and then um, we're essentially going to be collecting contacts of who want to who wants to be partnered with a mentor that mentor will then of course be very specific to your property lastly the only thing I would answer, uh, add, add is um, as you're going through this process, give us feedback. You know, things that are working, not working, because we're always looking to build a better mousetrap. And again, we're learning as we go along. So if there's resources that you need that we aren't providing, let us know what those are. Or let us know what, you know, what worked well or what uh, you need some additional um, assistance with. And, and we will tables. try to, yeah, we will try to yeah, get more tables. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and if that's the worst thing we run across, we did pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, question back there. Do you know if there's been anything with whiting or clover along all this stuff? I live in whiting. Uh, the question was, is there anything in whiting or plover that's similar to this? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I can tell you that in, in the village of whiting, if you are looking to convert your whole lawn to native plants, you have to submit a plan and you have to get approval from all of the adjacent landowners. Uh -huh. So if they don't like your idea, then they can shoot it down. But again, that's that's part of the plan, right? Just like Mark's saying, it, you, you, having the plan and saying, here, there's actually a plan to this. These plants are going to be involved. This is why I'm doing it. It's not just, I'm going to stop mowing my lawn. Uh, do you like it or do you not like it? Um, it's it's more than that. There's, there's a plan to it. So I do know a couple in Whiting that have done it uh, and they they got approval from all the natives and or from all the neighbors <laughs> and the natives approved as well um, so it, it went forward yeah so it does happen 
And I don't think Plover, because somebody did contact me from Plover, a resident contacted me and wanted to bring the proposal forward to the village board because they have nothing. I mean, they just have the typical turf grass standard in Plover. Um, but he had contacted me with some specific questions about the ordinance and what he would have to do as a citizen in order to get something in place in Plover. So it's my understanding Plover would, it, there's nothing in their ordinance that would allow it right now. But that, again, that was from a resident that contacted me probably a month or two ago. I do know that the village of Clover, though, um, is looking at um, getting more comfortable with that idea and that they are putting up a couple of um, native plant displays. One is along the Springville Pond area, and they're looking at one, if anybody lives in Clover, they're looking at one around Lake uh, Packwell Lake. So it's encouraging that there's discussion, but like you said, it hasn't gotten to the point that Stephen's point has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's this perception that uh, native lawns are messy or probably just look like a field. Um, Paul has, you know, he has native plantings, but it's segmented to be very aesthetically pleasing. There's certain areas of points of interest uh, in his yard and garden. Uh, there are, of course, people who have a more wild um, yard. And in those instances, that's where enforcement gets really tricky. Can I talk about the? You, you can, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone who's gone, uh, Near on Second Street, there's an antique shop, and right next door, there's a uh, <laughs> like a artistic home. Let's say the amount of complaints that we received in in our office for that property is substantial, just because you really can't see the home anymore. Um, but people felt like, oh, it's just overgrown, and they're not taking care of it. We reached out. She came in, huge plan, every single plant identified on a plan. And you said, oh, okay, you're good. So whenever we complain, they, people complain, we say, if you would you like to look at her landscape plan. So hers is more wild in nature, but it's still adhering to the requirements that we have for enforcement. Thank you for keeping that. It's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she even identified which plants were edible on her yeah. plant, so, which I appreciated. That was great. So I, I enjoy uh, a good forager. <laughs> yes. Great job. <laughs> yeah. I just have two questions. One, in your experience, how long do you need to smother grass for it to be ready to plant? Yeah, if it's in the middle of the summer, a month is enough. Um, because it gets hot enough. Um, the plants are trying to actively grow underneath and it's dry and it's hot and that, that will do it. Um, uh, again, along Piffner Park, that was starting on April 1st, April 2nd, somewhere around there. It wasn't really hot yet, but we were getting good south and west sun exposure. And so six weeks was enough even at that time of year to kill off the grass. Um, I remember a couple times I've accidentally left a tarp on the lawn for five days and it's dead so I'm, I think it can go faster than that it's just when you want it to die it seems to take longer um, but I would say a, a solid month is a good rule to go by leave it on there for a month for sure and again black tarp or rubber sheet or something like that don't use a silver tarp or a green tarp the grass will be happier under there than it is the rest of your lawn so it doesn't work and my second question is, do you have suggestions uh, for future planning on how to transition between a native yard and perhaps a neighbor who has a bordering yard that is not ready to be native? Like, are there aesthetically pleasing ways to transition to maintain a good relationship with your neighbor instead of just, you know, just letting things grow into their yard? Yeah, I would suggest talking with the neighbor and seeing what kinds of plants they like. They may have things in mind like, oh, I really like purple coneflowers. Could you put that in there on my side? I don't want to look at the rest of your stuff, but I'd be happy to look at purple coneflowers. Um, in our, our current home and our previous yard, we, we did that with the neighbors. We talked to them about what we were going to plant. and. Um, 
my daughter would also bring them flowers, <laughs> uh, so that never hurts. Um, I have a neighbor currently that is in her late 80s, I think, and she came down to our, she rode her bike over, which is awesome. Mm. Uh, she rode her bike over to our house when we were outside, and she said, I just want to let you know that I have never seen so many butterflies in my yard before, and I've lived here for 60 years or whatever. Uh, and she said, I completely attribute that to what you did with your yard. So this is great. Thank you. I love looking at it. I love driving by it. Um, our neighbors have been pretty, pretty welcoming of the idea, even though we do have neighbors that are pretty much all lawn care type people. They've got irrigation sprinklers. They've got fertilizer companies coming out. Um, but they're very appreciative of what we've done. They're very accepting of what we've done. It's because we've had the discussion with them. It's not, we've just, they're not just in the dark about what's going on. Um, a lot of the families on our street also have young kids. And so one of the things I mentioned that I could go on and on about before uh, is that we, we also have bought some aquariums with screen lids, 10 gallon aquariums, and we use those to distribute basically a monarch rearing setup to each of the families on the street. And so they come over and the, the kids come to our house and they collect their own caterpillars out of our yard and then they bring their tank with their plants. We raise the plants in the backyard and they take the whole thing back and they, they raise the monarchs in their, in their house and everybody in the family gets to watch it happen and then they bring their, their consumed milkweeds back, they put them back on the rack, take some new stuff, and we just supply them with what they need. And then the kids say, hey mom, we should plant some milkweeds in our yard, and we should plant some of these asters in our yard. And so these little native plant gardens have been popping up around our street. And um, the plants that we have left at the end of the season, especially the milkweeds, they get eaten, put back on the rack, they sprout again. We can use them a few times throughout the season, but then at the end of the season, we give them all away. So all the neighbors are like, hey, do you want five swamp milkweeds and two butterfly weeds? And they say, sure, bring them over. So we give them all away, and it's a, it's a free way to get native plants, and so people have a hard time turning that down. Paul, I think yeah. what you said is kind of the whole point of this, it's like what you did is sprouting off little, you know, native gardens. Doesn't mean you have to transform your entire yard, but you know, you could be giving inspiration to someone being like, you know what, this year I'm gonna do a, like a little patch and then maybe it goes well and it grows and grows over time. Like that's our goal is to promote more of this uh, throughout the city. Mm -hmm. And I try to be accepting of whatever a landowner wants to do. I mean, just I'm not going to tell the neighbor that their lawn sucks and I, I hate it. It's it's polluting the water. And I mean, it's you can have those conversations, but I'm not going to be criticizing anybody else for their choice because I don't want them to be criticizing my choice. Everybody should just be accepting of what that landowner would like to do. In my case, it's using natives instead of having a, a big lawn. That conversation is really important. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, all right. I will hang around for a little bit. We're going to be tearing down. But thank you for coming. Yeah. If you have any questions about this presentation, email community development at stevenspoint.com, call 715-346-1567 extension 1, or visit stevenspoint.com slash lawn gone native.